They're coming to get you, Barbara. Buried deep in the Pacific Northwest, one team in Springfield, Oregon, takes on the impossible, finding dead Mopar muscle and bringing it back from the grave. Award-winning master of Mopar, Mark Warman, his cousin, Doug, his daughter, Alyssa, his best friend, Royal, his painter, Will, his assembly tech, Justin, and the rest of the GYC ghouls are restoring, resurrecting, and recreating some of the fastest, fiercest, and rarest muscle cars on the planet. This is Graveyard Cars. All right, just to catch everybody up on our 71 Barracuda project, this is the one that George and I basically built from scratch a couple of seasons ago. The guy who commissioned me to build it wanted a real 1971 Plymouth Barracuda. So those pickings are pretty slim out there. That's why I ended up buying a really rough, rusty one. So I'd still have all the right numbers for it. It'd be a real car. When we were done, we wouldn't have to have an assigned VIN for it. But it was rough. So the fact is the only parts that we were really able to harvest was the roof, the roof inner structure, and the peripheral pieces that go around it. You have to have those because at the time, nobody was making them. Now, AMD is making them. I should have saved more money and just cut the roof off of it and had it dipped and not bothered with the car. But because I wasn't sure until all of the paint is off of it, what it looks like, we sent the whole car out and had it dipped. Well, you can see in the pictures when we got that thing back, with the roof cut off it, there was nothing left. It's funny, when we actually got through going through our parts department and laying all the sheet metal out, it was like a great big AMD billboard. I mean, there was literally almost every part except for the roof. So, you know, when you're building a car, especially one like this where it's from scratch, it's, it's a lot like maybe building a house would be. You got to build that foundation. Foundation needs to be square. So the way we started was the rear frame rails. Set those down on the frame jig. Those are established values. Welded in the cross member for it, the, the shock cross member. From there, we moved to the front of the car where we installed the frame rails and the torsion bar cross member. We also added the K member, which adds a lot of strength and holds the car geometrically square. In this case, we started out by putting the trunk floor from floor extensions in okay. place, the under seat pan, very important, crucial part, the step wells, the main floor. We even put the two hinge pillars in place because those would be technically the next pieces before we can go up. So with the foundation built for the car, the next thing would be to put on the B pillars. This is a part of the car that has to be in its established place. From there, we could do the inner and outer wheelhouses. We did the rear cross member with its extensions on it. When we were finished putting the floors and the, and the lower stuff on and began like with the wheelhouses and the pillars, Will came by and said, why don't I paint everything now? And that was actually a great idea. One thing that's super cool and super easy about this particular car, A, it's black, so it's just a 9300 single stage, super easy. And when Mark and George get all of their inner structure parts and pieces welded, grinded, and done, and before they put any type of outer structure on, it's super easy to go in there, get some jam work done. That way, by the time this car is fully done and assembled, from top to bottom, every square inch of this car is painted. I give him credit. I hadn't even thought about it. Normally, he can't do any paint work on a car, or she doesn't do the paint work on a car until, you know, it's ready for that. Once we set the roof on there, that's great. We just vice gripped it into place because there's so many critical points that can move just a little bit but give you all the alignment you need. That's why you see us putting doors on next. That way you can match up your quarter panel skins that you have to put on it. You can put the rest of the sheet metal on. We can start building out the front inner structure. But again, we're not gonna weld that roof on until we know that the firewall and the cowl and the hinge pillars are all where they belong. The doors are in space where they go. With that, we can begin doing the welding. The only thing I like to do is hold tough until we have the front inner structure on and That's what we did next. All of the front inner structure, if those aprons aren't right where they're supposed to go, if those shock towers aren't right where they're supposed to go, you're going to have either alignment problems with the car or you're going to have sheet metal alignment problems. You're going to have fenders that just can't come back far enough because the aprons were welded on a half of an inch too far forward, and I've seen that. So just like we do on every other car, all the parts and pieces that are getting like new quarter panels, we take them, sand them out nicely, 
put the sound deadener on them, and then I'm able to go ahead and hit it with the 9300 single stage. So when they put that car together, it's got sound deadener every square inch, every square inch has color on it, and it's just the easiest way to do it if you're replacing quarter -man. Uh, Mark and George did a great job getting this car put together. Now that it's all welded, everything's looking good. At that point, it's able to come over to me and I can do the jam work on it. And then once I jam it, I'm just gonna panel paint the whole car. So once I get this car, going from start to finish is gonna be super quick. So the best part of a build like this is when it begins to look like a car. And you can actually see the fruits of your labor, if you will. And saying, wow, we built this thing literally Below the roof line, we built it from nothing. The black paint looks beautiful that Will did on it. He wanted this car to look as close to a real 71 Hemi Cuda as possible. It's absolutely gonna be stunning. With this particular car, we did it a little bit differently. I shot the body first, completely separate. That way I could just get it in, get it out, get it buffed, and get it over to Justin's area. While Noah was doing that, I was able to grab the hood, fenders, all the parts and pieces, and do the final paint on them. Because it is a black single stage, I don't have to worry about the color matching at all. It all comes out of one can, and it's all gonna match. The only thing that you do have to take into consideration is it is four coats, and that is a thick product, and you don't wanna get it to solvent pop, so you definitely wanna give it maybe you know, 20 minutes. Let the car tell you how much time it needs in between each coat. After that, I just kick it over to Noah. He does the cut and buff on it, and then we go over and assemble the whole car, and it's ready for Justin to build. Let's study the facts and learn how Chrysler Plymouth is coming through with a new Barracuda. First off, you can see there's a new look up front with new dual headlamps and new circular parking lights in the stone shield under the bumper. The new grills are exciting. Cuda here features a colored grille available in nine body colors. Very unusual. Ventless side glass is a stylish feature which also affords better visibility for driver and passengers. Door handles are flush with the body, adding to the streamlining and convenience to opening the wide doors. Stay tuned to see how Plymouth makes it. So when it came time to put the car together, I grabbed my team. I trust them, I love them, I like to build them up, but I just feel a little bit better if I'm directly involved, overseeing it, no silliness, let's get the car hung together without having any problems. Sweet You worry too much. Yeah, because you have no finesse. So you'll notice is what has had to happen if I've had to come over. Because with these guys, we have Josh, who's very careful, doesn't like to make anybody upset. Then you have Shane. Like one day, he's the best tech in the world. And then there's other days where he likes to give me a headache, and he'll, be, he'll chip. And when he delivers bad news is when he'll walk over to you smiling. I have no idea what Will's talking about. I just want to make these cars perfect. It doesn't make me happy, and I just look like I'm smiling all the time. Oh, look at you go. See? Do you see how hard he slams that? <laughs> it's funny for me because when I watch Will manage his people, he's kind of like me. I mean, he, he likes to give them a hard time. His relationship with the guys is great. He does like to tease them. Uh, in the case of Shane, they go back almost 25 years, I think. Shane was mean to me in high school, too. No matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. Every time I built a car, it was crap to him. That was after high school. <laughs> Me and Will went to high school together. He was kind of a butcher. He his blazer. Hey, you got your first interview going, color. huh? I feel like I heard the word butcher. I would never say that word. That's not a, that's a mean word. So I don't butcher anything and I'm not a butcher? Not anymore. You're doing quality work here. We are, because I do such a quality job that's brought your level up. Want to go back yeah. to work now? <laughs> <laughs> Get back to butchering. Oh, see? God, that's not even funny. <laughs> I was just trying to help. For Christmas one year, my mom got me everything I need to finish my blazer. And then I painted it like bright blue. And then Shane said it was an ugly blue. <laughs> he painted his blazer in ugly color and I pointed it out. Once again, I was just trying to help. Let me tell you something, Shane is negative. That is the most negative human being on the planet. He just walks by and says, yeah, that girl looks like crap. What, hey, whoa, what'd you say? What, come back here, what? Girl looks like crap. 
Are you saying the grill looks like crap? Mmm. Well, now that we're in the business of putting, in some cases, million dollar cars together, I love him. Be as picky and negative as you want, because these cars are perfect when they leave here. You know, at the end of the day, we have a great team. You know, from our more experienced guys like Josh and Shane, even to our new guys like Brody. Couldn't be happier. Everyone's working very well together. We're getting a lot of cars done. It is very rewarding for me as a shop owner, as the dream maker, to see a car like that go from literally a truckload of auto metal direct sheet metal and a used roof and become what's going to be a family heirloom. So recently we got in a 1970 CUDA, 446 barrel automatic FE5 Rally Red shaker car. Alyssa is going to validate the car herself, tell me what she thinks, if she believes it's a real 446 barrel car. Then we'll go from there and we'll find out if it is or if it's not. This is something we have never shared with anybody ever, the type of real minutia. We're talking the deep down detail where if you were the best of the best in the world and you were gonna pull off a clone or a rebody and sell it as an original, there's probably a handful of guys in the world you wouldn't want to look at that car with no paint on it. Me. I would be one, Tony D'Agostino would be the I'd other, be the and other. I can't mention the others because they won't Obviously, pay me that's enough why money. I'm here. <laughs> what? I'm kidding. Mom jeans? Of I course, this is what this was Congratulations. Hot. It's, it's, Hated them in the 80s, hate them now. I never understood why the hip line has to be all the way up underneath their armpits. Kowalski, take a real nice look at Kowalski right there. Who's Based that remind you of nose. with an afro? Well, you're close. That's cousin same, Dougie. Same, same family, same jeans. Go back same, and watch Vanishing Point when Kowalski's getting ready to drive into the bulldozers and he gets that grin on his face because he knows he's about to end it all, stop it right there and take a real nice look at Cousin Dougie with an afro. And you tell me that isn't Cousin Dougie. <laughs> it's not the point of this. It's a 70 Cuda. Let's go have a look at this okay, car. Sounds you ready? Good. You, yep. Yeah. Let's see what's inside for the driver and passengers of America's most beautiful and sporty car. Barracuda is generously proportioned to accommodate four adults in comfort with a full-width rear seat that's roomy enough for three. No other car in Barracuda's class has this capacity. The optional console makes the compartment a cockpit with extra storage space that's always welcome. The locking lever for the door is neatly recessed in the inside armrest. And for 1971, there's keyless door locking from outside. You merely press the lever and shut the door, and the car's locked. It's fast and easy, and you won't lock yourself out of the car, because if you leave the ignition key in the switch, the ignition lock warning buzzer sounds off to remind you. Here's what I believe to be the original fender tag. Take okay. a look at it. What makes me think that this is an original fender tag? Is there so, anything on there that I've taught you in the past? So what stands out the most is the pitting. Also, there's okay. a bend. Yep. So there's usually a, a screw right here, and they're going to pull it up to paint underneath it and pull it back. So that bend is great to see. Through the loin. I want you to read the vehicle identification number to me. It's BS23. What does that mean? What does BS23 mean? That means that this car started life as a CUDA. Very Is that good. right? That's true. Yep, special okay. price class represents CUDA, 70 to 74. OK. The next one is V0E. What does that mean? The V means that it was a 446 barrel. The zero is going to represent the year, so that means it was built in 1970. And the E is going to represent the plant, which E stands for Los Angeles. So that means this car that? was built in Los Angeles. How about that, folks? And How then it ends with 112159. Which we call the serial number. The serial number. OK. I would like you to go to this car based on only things that I've taught you in the past and see if you can validate those numbers against the hidden body numbers on this 1970 okay. Cuda. Well, that's easy because you're going to find this serial number in two places on the car. Over the years, I've spent a lot of time with Alyssa and tried carefully to teach her. And at times, many times, I felt like she wasn't listening. But this is a great example that a lot of that stuff has stuck. This wasn't staged. When I asked her those questions, 
most of the time she thought I was trying to trick her, but she still guessed the right answers on it. She has learned a lot. One of the places is gonna be up here. This number should be the same as this. One, one, two, one, five, nine. So it matches. It matches, all right. So that's great. And where that's do you think the other numbers are in the roof? No. In the tail panel? It's gonna be down here in the core support down or the, core the radiator support, support depending radiator on who you're support, talking to. Who, yeah. One, one, two, one, five, nine. All right. So, so all kidding aside, I want your opinion now. Does this radiator support, yoke or core support, match the vehicle identification number, serial number, to the upper cowl panel? Now, the way you ask me. It wasn't a trick. I don't know. It feels does like a this trick. this part match but that But it does. It matches. Oh. It all looks good. Everything looks legit. So what is your opinion of this 1970 Cuda? Would you it's say? A legit it's a legit 1970 Cuda. It's a legit 70 Cuda. Well, I had already acclimated myself with this car, and I knew what direction I was going, but it was so intricate, and frankly, something we haven't seen before to this level, and I don't want to spoil what it is. You'll see what it is that I'm talking about, but that's why I got Alyssa involved. First off, if you just even look at this area in general. Looks like it's been worked. Yeah, you see all the little welds that have been ground down and mm -hmm. cut down? That should be a nice pinch weld, a nice pinch spot weld all the way down. If you look down through here, Look at those welds that have all been plug welded. That's all right. supposed to be a real, well, if you look over there, you see, that's what yeah, it's supposed to look nice. like. Yep. So I believe that that baffle right there, that little piece there that's welded to this, I think it started life on that apron. I don't think it started life on that. I've trained her on what to look for. She should know if a panel has been replaced. Well, if a panel's been replaced, that's fine. The question is why, and you're gonna see why. So Mark is pushing really hard to get the drivetrain ready for the 71 Hemi Cuda. And the only thing I have left to build is the Dana rear end. And since Hunter is new, I'm gonna go ahead and use this opportunity to show him how to assemble this thing. Good morning, sir. Good morning. You ready to put this thing together? Yes, sir. Okay. So this is a brand new Mosier Dana, nine and three quarter rear end. First thing I install are the backing plates. So here's one of these backing plates that you've been detailing for me for quite a long time. So what I've done is installed all the brakes on this. I'm gonna show you how this thing works. All right. That's a wheel cylinder. It's gonna expand those shoes out, lock the drum, and that's how the car stops. All right. So when I apply the air to the wheel cylinder, it's the same effect as having the brake fluid under pressure. It expands the pistons, which pushes the brake shoes out against the brake drum. So I got the gasket in place here. I need you to hold these bolts in place for me. And we're gonna put this on the driver's side of the Dana rear end here. Gotcha. How do you know it's the driver's side? Well, because this is the front. This is the primary shoe, and this hole is where the park brake cable goes in, and it always goes forward. So Doug's a really good teacher. He's super calm. Just sometimes he gets a little confused. So if I put this on the other side, the brake cable would be going out the back, and it wouldn't look right. <laughs> Makes sense. Right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably just me, though. I want to be real careful when I slide this axle in through the seal because it's a real tight fit. And we've got some real nice sealed bearings on here. So normally we have to replace the bearings on the axles, pack them with grease before we assemble these. But these Mosier axles have sealed bearings, makes for a nice, clean, easy assembly. We're gonna line up our gasket and get the plate on it. How you doing back there? Yeah, all the bolts are through. Okay, so we got the driver's side axle in place, so we're gonna go ahead and spin the whole carton and we'll do the All other right. side. Let's see if you've been paying attention. True or false, the 1971 Cuda featured a color-keyed grille available in six body colors. If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll see if you're right. Well, how did you do? True or false? The 1971 Cuda featured a color-keyed grille available in six body colors. If you said false, then you've been paying attention and are absolutely correct. The 1971 Cuda featured a color-keyed grille available in nine body colors with enough goodies to turn on and turn up in the winner's circle. Look, shaker hood, four-speed or torque flight, Hemi suspension, heavy duty drum brakes, F60 by 15 tires, plus trim items, all standard. The bold look with 60.7 inch rear tread is dramatized by CUDA's black paint treatment at the rear. 
with relocated backup lights as a safety improvement. Optional rally cluster includes a 150 mile an hour speedometer, odometer, tachometer, clock with a second hand, and full instrumentation. All controls flood lighted for convenience and safety. For the king of the road, there's Hemi Cuda. So on the inside here, I believe that everything from the firewall where it meets the floor, the floor back is all one car. And okay. it's not and never was a 446 Barracuda. It was a Barracuda Grand Coupe. To me, this is really fascinating stuff. Seems like this car didn't start life altogether, and I'm really excited to see where my dad's gonna go with it. Note these welds. Mm -hmm. How should the cowl and the floor be united? With a pinch weld, and you can see the original ones are the like maybe an inch you, or a spot weld, you, I mean. You see how the factory did it here, because yeah. I believe these rails also, see how nice those are? Yeah. Okay, the rails on this car started life on this floor. So what we've established right now is that the front inner fenders and frame rails started life on the same car. It's obvious that they did when you look at the spot welds. The radiator support, at least the upper tie bar that has the numbers in it, did not start on it. Well, that's okay. Cars were wrecked in the 70s. When they were, they went to a wrecking yard. If the part wasn't available, they got a used core support that happened to have a different set of numbers in it, and they welded it on there because numbers didn't matter in 1972. So that isn't shocking. Now here's where things get interesting. The floor started life on those frame rails I just mentioned on the front of the car. But it appears that the firewall didn't. The firewall happens to be the panel that carries numbers in it. So you have to ask yourself, why? The rockers started life on the floor. The floor started life on the front frame rails, but we're having some other parts slipping in there. So what we need to establish next is, what about the roof and the back of the car? Where did it start life? And what do we have right here? and we have holes for a vinyl top. Let's say this car, this 446 barrel fender tag, that it started life with a black vinyl top. Do you remember what the sales code would be for a black vinyl top? So I know it's gonna be V, and then the number is gonna be the color, and then X, so black is what is it? V1X. V1X, okay. I can't believe that I'm actually starting to remember the sales codes, because when I first started working with my dad, I mean, everything was so foreign to me. Show me a V1X on that fender tag. I only see one code at all with V, and that's the V0E, which we know doesn't, isn't referencing Correct. that. So right. no, that's I don't see, would it be on the top line? It's in alphabetical order, so it would be at the very top line, yes. Okay, then no. This no V1X? Nope. What color is the car? What's the, the paint is code? The red, so oh, it's gonna be um, FE5. Right, and then the second notch up? It's also FE5, means which means the top, the top color. body color. And they never had a red vinyl top available? No. Right, so? Holy cow, this roof section didn't even come on the same car as the fender tag. I did not see that one coming. Did so that this means this car should life. just be painted, right? It should it all should just be, be FE5. All one color, monochromatic, if you will. Yeah. So that means that we shouldn't have holes for a vinyl top on it. This Grand Coupe had a vinyl it top. It had a vinyl top. Wasn't mandatory, still optional. So I'm okay. not saying it was mandatory on there, but this car, wherever its little fender tag is out there in La La Land, it had a vinyl top. We got it turned around now and it's facing towards you, so what are we gonna put on first? I'm assuming the gasket. Correct. Hunter, have you ever worked on cars as a kid? Never, I always thought they were super cool, especially the old school, the Mopars. Uh-huh. They always looked cool as a kid, I always wanted one, but I never worked on any. Look at you now. <laughs> exactly, <yeah. laughs> Okay, you wanna bring the other backing plate over? All right, this is really nice, having the brakes installed on the backing plate. So Doug had me help build the brake system on the backing plates ahead of time. And I can see why, because afterwards it made the assembly go like super smoothly. And it's nice because I'm learning a lot about it. And now we're ready for another axle. So first we want to make sure that the body panel that I'm about to talk about started life on this shell. We've established that the shell itself is a Grand Coupe. Correct. So here's the rear body panel. Here's the trunk gutter, which welds to the quarters, which makes up the shell. Do those spot welds all look pretty original and unmanipulated to you? I would say yes. I would say yes too. So here's gonna be the key part of this entire thing. We know that the front frame rails were factory welded to the floor that is in this car and those are welded to the rockers. That's big structural stuff, that's big time stuff. We know that the core support is off of another car and it would appear 
that the firewall is off of another car, which both of those items, the core support and the firewall, both happen to have the hidden body numbers in them. What does the back of this car look like? Did it start life on the same floor pan and under seat pan, meaning is everything from the cowl back one particular car? We need to find that out. Which of these two emblems would you expect to You're see on the, the back? Barracuda. The Barracuda, not the Cuda. Right. All right, take a look real close here at this rear body panel. You see that change in color looks like? Looks like they filled in a hole. Looks like they welded up a hole? Yep. Actually, the other day I took a flashlight in there, turned out the lights, ran it on it, and you could actually see, see pinholes in the welds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's strange here is that it appears that the quarter panels, the roof, the floors, the rear body panels all started life on the same car, but that car appears to be a Grand Coupe. The dash VIN and the fender tag say it should be a Cuda. So there's something strange going on here. Man, so but... that means, did it have this emblem on it? No. Which, by the way, the 70 Cuda emblem is double-sided tape. The 3M tape. So if you look at Jim Roots, which we will in a minute, there's no evidence that there's anything Ever on there except double-sided tape. I've got a car out there that still has some of the double-sided tape yeah. on it to prove it. Here's a real Barracuda emblem. I happen to actually get off of a Grand Coupe, which is Still cool. has the red on the back? Right. <laughs> Take a look. Is there any chance that those three holes... It, like, matches up perfect. See what I'm getting at? Yeah. Somebody's welded all those holes up, and they put a double-stick Cuda emblem on there. But there's more evidence. Because it's a Grand Coupe, this is the Grand Coupe crest. Okay. It goes over the trunk lock cylinder, and you oh slide it gosh. over to the as soon side. As soon you put it up. Uh-huh. There's up. You'd slide it over the side. Now, Dougie still has his little leather pouch that he used to keep in his left rear pocket. And he'd pull that pouch out, and he'd shake it free until he had the trunk key out, because he's a southpaw. And he'd reach over there with his left hand. He'd slide. I always thought it was just the coolest. This is such a weird thing, but everybody remembers different things from when they were a kid. I love watching him switch that out of the way and go in there and put the key in. <laughs> that is true. I did do that. In fact, I think I still have those keys after all these years. Oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> after all these years, I still have those keys. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Wish I had the car. <laughs> it needs a great big hole for that. Yeah, I mean, and you can see two little right holes here. for that. And you can see the big hole here. here you can see the small okay. one there and the small one there. So when I put that up there, I actually went out back the other day just to make sure to an original Grand Coupe and plunk this right in those holes. This is the kind of experience that I was hoping someday to be able to share with Alyssa. This is a great example of it. Somebody welded up the rear body panel, like I said where the Barracuda emblem was, where the crest was. The experience is invaluable. Mandatory on all CUDA models in 1970 and 1971 was M88, Michael 88. Do you see an M88 on there anywhere? Oh, okay. okay, M88, yeah. Right. That's called the rear body moldings. They, I call it a racetrack molding. On a CUDA, they come right along here. These that hold this little thin stainless steel molding. You couldn't get that molding on any other model but a Cuda. Okay. If you ordered a Grand Coupe, you got quarter finish moldings. A Grand Coupe has a molding that goes on the end of the quarter, a little eyebrow molding, all right? The Cuda doesn't use that. The regular Barracuda doesn't use that. The Grand Coupe uses that. If you look at these quarter panels, where those moldings potentially would go if it was a Grand Coupe, three holes welded up each side, I went out back and I double checked against a Grand Coupe. Everything that I have that's Grand Coupe fits perfectly in that car. Barracuda emblem, Grand Coupe crest over the lock cylinder, and those moldings. I am sure that the back of that car is a Grand Coupe, and I am sure that somebody went to great lengths to make sure it didn't look like a Grand Coupe. New, now, Barracuda. Here's what it's all about. Long, sleek hood, short rear deck, the look of power. The standard Cuda mill is the 383 four-barrel, 335 horsepower V8 of Roadrunner fame with four great power options. There's the 344 barrel, the 440 four-barrel, a 440 with three two-barrel Holly carbs, and the topper, the 426 Hemi. Plymouth makes it. 
All right, so once Alyssa and I had made it all the way around the car, we even looked at the bottom side of it. We didn't have time to share all that with you. I wanted her, just one more time, even though she's seen it before, I want her to see what all the areas that we're saying have been compromised, where welding has been done and panels have been changed. I wanted her to see an unmolested original version of it. The best one we have just came back from the Dipper. It's Jim Root from Slipknot, cool guy. It's a 70 Cuda. His car is a very, very nice car, very solid car, very pure car. I brought it in here and went over it with Alyssa in the exact same areas that we did on the Grand Coupe, Cuda, whatever it is. Look at the spot weld. You can just tell nobody's ever been there. This is just as pure as they can come. It's absolutely beautiful. You go to that one. Now, again, that one still has the original aprons on it, so it looks like this. They're a little yeah. ugly, but they're factory ugly. Yeah. As it makes a run down there, how sanitary everything is. Everything fits the way that it should fit. Wow. When you see how the panels are assembled from the factory and how clean everything is on Jim Root's car, you can tell that the car that we're looking at now has some serious issues. Same thing now. Take a look at where the firewall meets the floor. See that seam across there? Mm-hmm. All spot welded, no big blob welds marrying the two together like our other car have. Right. This pan right here started life on that firewall, which started life on that core support, which started life on the front frame rails, started life on the core support. The last thing I wanted to show Alyssa was the rear body panel. Do you see any one evidence right that here. anything's ever been welded there? Nope. How about here where the Barracuda emblem went? Nope. No, no holes for that because no it probably had marks. the CUDA, which has the double-sided Double tape. tape. So, see this here where there's original. any signs of a Grand Coupe molding on that quarter? Nope. The only thing you see are super sanitary, even more sanitary than those, mm -hmm. holes for the M88 rear body panel molding. Right. That's because the car is a real CUDA. Mm -hmm. All right, so at the end of the day, it was obvious to me the fender tag and dash VIN call it to be a 1970 CUDA 446 barrel automatic. Unfortunately, didn't start life on that body. It's what you would call a rebody. Rebodying is where you take a car that's rotted, and you've seen them. I've showed you cars that are rotted beyond repair, even for graveyard cars, but they still have a fender tag, they still have a dash fin, they still have a title. Then they go out and find a similar car to it that survived pretty darn well because it was a six cylinder car or it was a 318 car. They go out, buy that car, cut these numbers out, and put them in there. That's a normal rebody. This is much more extensive. This has an original firewall, upper cow panel, and core support off of a 446 barrel grafted into a 70 Barracuda Grand Coupe. This has been so educational for me. I'm so grateful I got to walk around this car with my dad. I know that my dad is really knowledgeable on Mopars, but for him to be able to look at a car's original DNA and be able to tell you what engine, what transmission, everything about the car just by looking at the shell, that's amazing. I had a nice conversation with the owner. I explained it to him. I said, listen, we can stop right now. I'll give you back whatever deposit we haven't used on the car. No harm, no foul. I'll even help you put it back together again. You can put it on eBay or whatever and just sell it as is. Really, it's a assembled car at that point. And he said, no, man. He says, I always wanted a 446 barrel car. And even if it's a tribute, I've seen the tributes you guys do and they're stunning. So I say, ride it out. And that's what we're doing. We're riding it out and we're gonna finish that car. What else makes a CUDA? 9,000 candle power road lamps standard, hood lock pins, black rear deck panel, and chromed exhaust tips, all standard. Luxurious leather interior is an option on the all new CUDA. An overhead console at with three warning lights is included with the leather interior option, door ajar, low fuel, and fastened seat belts. All friendly reminders of how Plymouth makes it. The optional rally cluster, a 150 mile per hour speedometer, red line tack, and competition clock with sweep second hand. Goes in this way? Uh huh. Just be careful going through the gasket there. Kind of lift up on it? Yep. Okay. Do you know why they're red? On the assembly line, if a car was to have style wheels, which mm -hmm. is something that you could see through, they wanted to paint the drums red. So I never really like understood the knowledge and like the details and whatever to like actually fully get the like job done. I thought it was one of those things like, oh, we put the car together and you know, we're good to go. But it's not like that. <laughs> like that. 
Now the drum can't fall off on anybody. All right. All right. Since it is upright right now, we could put the brake lines on. Go ahead and start it in the wheel cylinder. And then your brake lines will go right in there like this. Okay, so now that we got all that done, we can go ahead and roll it upside down. Okay. And put our leaf springs on. Hey, Doug? Yeah? What are these? That's the park brake cable. Okay. Uh, what oh, are these going on? Oh, is that the thing that we were supposed to be putting in two hours ago? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hunter. No problem. <laughs> well, this is what I meant by school of hard knocks. I just thought I would have graduated by now. <laughs> so they're gonna go through that hole that we kept talking about that points to the front of the car. Yeah. It's gonna curve around and it's gonna go in behind That's the brake shoe. Okay, yep. gotcha. So the parking brake cable holds the shoes against the drum, just like when you push the brake pedal, only it can hold them that way until you release the handle. And it's gonna go back down in. It's kind of a pain to get in there. <laughs> it's really difficult with the brake shoes in place. Okay. Perfect. The last things we have to install are the leaf springs. We get brand new reproduction leaf springs, but they don't come with the numbered leaves that we get from Tony's part, so we have to install them before we put these on. And then these go underneath? Uh-huh, like this. Ah, gotcha. The only thing we have left to put on is the pinion snubber. So here's how the pinion snubber works. It's mounted on the top of the rear end. When you accelerate really hard, the rear end twists up in the air. Well, the pinion snubber comes up against the bottom of the body and prevents the axle from twisting too hard, therefore losing traction and control of the car. Line it up there. Line it up. I'll go ahead and run it down. And there we have it. And voila. All built out. <laughs> Teamwork makes a dream work. Yes, sir, it does. Yeah, teamwork makes dream work, that's great. Yeah, remember that in about 30 seconds. So finally, we got it done. We got it done. Right? <laughs> you got any questions of me? Uh, well, I got one. There was numbers on the bottom of the leaf spring. So I'm just curious what the numbers are. 34,024, uh -huh. 34,034. What does that mean? Well, the odd side goes on the driver's side and the even side goes on the passenger side. Yeah, but both of the numbers were even. Yeah, but one starts with a three. So that makes it odd. Is forward still forward? Not if you flip it over. Or turn it around 180. Then backwards you... forward and forwards backwards. Oh, I saw this little routine. Yeah, Abbott and Costello, who's on first? <laughs> Except they were funny. But isn't right left and left is right? Well, if it's upside down. OK. So you always put the odd on the driver's side. But the odds are four and four? No, they're 34 and 24. Divide them by two. You divide them by two? Yeah, that makes it, that's how you figure out which is odd and which is even. Oh, okay. And that is a wrap. Nice. <laughs> <laughs>
probably is the coolest thing modern world technology has to offer one of these old cars that I didn't even know about until I started building this system out. Hemi Cuda Shaker Bubble with all the goodies, all the fixings on it, the weather strip, everything in place. Original pulleys, power steering, water pump, crank shaft, alternator. All those are the original components you see on a 66 to 71 Hemi. Correct date coated marking upper radiator hose. Correct date coated and markings lower radiator hose. All of that stuff is OEM style. What's well, cool, second generation Hemi setting on a Magnum Force Transformer front suspension. You got the old school Hemi going along with the new school technology. So now power rack and pinion steering, just like a late model car would have. Got an inch and a quarter front sway bar with nylon bushings. Look at the actual K-member itself. Look at how beefy this thing is. Look at the gussets, the welds. That will help hold that unibody together. Lower control arms look like they're off of a one-ton truck. Coil over, front suspension, beautiful, fully adjustable. We're still running OEM spindles, rotors, and calipers off of what would be a 71 Cuda. As we move to the back, again, everything at a glance is OEM 71 Hemi Cuda, except that transmission. That is the Silver Sport A41 automatic transmission, which is electronically shifted. You'll want to take a second and write that down. The best part, the part I've been keeping a secret, I'm going to lift the base plate off. These are not Carter carburetors. This is Edelbrock electronic fuel injection using throttle bodies that with these two spacers, we can run a stock shaker setup on a 71 Hemi Cuda. So when you're driving that car down the road and somebody says, hey, there goes a 71 Hemi Cuda, look at that shaker, mandatory on all Hemi cars. Only on the Cudas, not on the Challenger, by the way. You could say, I had no idea. When they take that thing off and you see that it's got modern day electronic fuel injection. That was a neat call on the owner's part. I actually pushed back, I didn't want to do it because I don't like to learn new things. Part of my charm, I like to do things the old fashioned way. But this was a really neat exercise. I'm looking forward to firing it up and hearing it run. So Mark came and got Hunter and I to help with the installation of the drivetrain in this car. And this is really good experience for Hunter to learn how to install these. I was really hoping we could leave the shaker on there, but it's just, it's too tight. In between those fender wells and the aprons, it's just too tight. So I had Doug take it off so we could get that thing installed. So I thought this was gonna be a really tight fit with a lot of wiggling. But this thing went in with hardly any interference at all. What a miracle. <laughs> Once we get the Magnum Force K-member up against the frame rails, we align it, and then all we have to do are put in the four bolts and the rest of the hardware. Let's put some wheels and tires on. You like okay. wheels and tires, don't you? I like wheels and tires. All right, I'll raise it up. Okay. He-Man. No He-Man here. No? All right, get some lug nuts out, Mary. Okay, okay. Alice. Alice? What's that mean? Why you, why you call don't me Don't you have Mary? a restaurant? Alice has a restaurant. <laughs> You're Alice. That's the whole point. Just, yeah, isn't there a cross, song about that? Cross tracks, about a half million miles from the railroad tracks. Yeah, those are the lyrics. Yeah. Those are exactly. Just walk right in, it's around the back. Just a half a mile from the railroad track. And you can get anything you want. It's your cousin Dougie. So once we got all the suspension in the car, we were able to lower it down, put those gorgeous Craig or five spokes on it with the BF Goodrich, roll it out into the middle of the shop, and voila. From dust to a complete 71 Hemi Cuda tribute car, there's just nothing cooler now.